So what I'm talking about today is a project that uh, the Cambridge Archaeological Unit carried out in 2016 in the summer. Um, it's on the site of a former 19th century socialist community and it was set up on principles of cooperation, equality and rational thought. Um, it was known as the Maine Colony or the Hodsonian Community after its founder, William Hodson, and it was made up of about 50 to 70 people. Um, but it only lasted 25 months, and there are a number of other colonies of a similar nature, none of them lasted more than four years apiece. Um, but uh, contemporary um, accounts suggest that prior to its demise, it managed to actually build a substantial infrastructure, um, but mainly owing to financial difficulties uh, and disagreement, um, it did fall apart quite rapidly. But it was then utilised as a site for another 120 years for occupation various other uh, forms. So of course there's not time here today to go through the whole colony's history, its aftermath and so on. <clears throat> what I'm going to focus on is the concept and the notion of time within that colony and how that relates to the materialisation of anticipation, effectively of an unrealised future, um, and how archaeologically we might be able to see this. Um, and then I want to sort of complete the presentation by looking at utopia as a legacy for later inhabitants or for later communities um, and to see if there is any sort of uh, vestige of these original ideals um, in these, uh, these later practices. So amounting to about 200 acres, um, the colony site situated between the villages of Welney and Mainy in the North Cambridgeshire Fenland. Um, this was once a wetland landscape that in the mid-17th century was drained by the cutting of two great big canals. Um, one of those canals is the Old Bedford River, or the Old Bedford Barrier Bank, and it's the earthen bank of that that forms the southern edge of the, uh, of the colony site. And there's a number of features of this particular landscape that were attractive for building this colony in the first place. Well, the first really is the land itself. It's cheap. Uh, but not only is it cheap, it's well nourished. It's full of rich nutrients, peat and so on. So it's quite uh, suitable for potential sustainability. Also, you can see this uh, large sort of blob here, which is uh, a quarry pit. And this would have provided the source materials for making bricks and tiles. Um, very useful at a time when actually it was very high taxation on those materials. And of course the river itself, a major transport route, a link between the inside and the outside world. But today really there's very little left um, of any form of uh, structural qualities on the site. Um, it is just an open arable field um, and the quarry pit itself is the only thing really that is uh, you know, the physical remnants um, of any community in this landscape and that today is used for fishing and recreation. <coughs> but the colony emerged at a time of social unrest and really the story and history of the colony signifies an important stage in what essentially was a non-violent development of socialist thought compared, compared to something like this which is the Chartist riots um, around about the same sort of time. And it's one of a number of uh, competing utopian societies that emerge in the second quarter of the uh, 19th century. Now, 2016, coincidentally, was also a very hot time for utopia in general. It was the quincentenary of Thomas More's publication of that name, um, in which an imaginary island was discovered in the New World, and it's introduced through a conversation between Moore um, and this explorer, R uh, Raphael Hathleday. Um, now, Moore was writing at the time of Henry VIII, and he offers a social critique um, of the time, so you know, a really quite dangerous thing to do. Um, but essentially, he's offering a new society, a new form of society to which others might wish to aspire. But it's both a, a wonderful society that is known as a good place, but it's also a place that is unattainable. Um, so it's a paradox. This word utopia is in, in essence a paradox. So to mark the quincentenary of uh, Moore's publication, the, the celebrations were, I suppose, focused upon the need for fresh aspirations. Um, and of course, much of this was marked by the political events of last year, and this was steeped with dystopian overtones. Uh, and much of the belief really was that the current generation cannot, that's us, cannot come up with a, a better world than the one that we've already got. But as Zygmunt 
uh, Bauman, uh, the, uh, the philosopher, has alerted us, it's a constitutive feature of the human condition to measure our standards of life against the possibility of its improvement in the future. Now, this is a 21st century way of looking at utopia, that is, as a concept for improvement through, by, uh, through progression, or by thinking bigger than what is possible in order to challenge the status quo. Now, by contrast, the notion of utopia in the 19th century, at least in the first half of the 19th century, was not just a concept for improvement, but was a place, or rather an end point, that you would reach and strive towards, and at that end point effectively would be the perfection of the human condition. So thinking big was really encouraged, but more importantly acting upon it, and often with considerable resources, was a particular characteristic of the age. Now I'm interested in utopias um, in this uh, 19th century context, partly because of the grandeur of these projects, and I suppose also their naivety, uh, but particularly because, as Sarah Tarlow has argued, uh, it not only marks the beginning of a true socialist movement, but really archaeology should be interested in ideal communities because they provide an alternative entry to the normative societies from which they emerge or against which they emerge. But of course they pose a practical challenge. So a lot of the, count, the accounts, the first-hand accounts that we have of these communities come from newspapers that were actually published by the communities themselves or by their competitors. So they're steeped in propaganda. And of course the statements that they make within these newspapers are very difficult to verify. Added to that, most of the institutions that were built for these communities to live in no longer exist. They've all been demolished. So of course it's with these absences that archaeology, we hope, can contribute. Now our own field work, on a relatively small scale, only seven trenches, um, but we had quite an intensive field walking program um, and geophysical survey as well, and it was a community archaeological project. So combining all of these, um, uh, these different resources, the aim really was a site characterization for management strategies in the future, but also to build this project into something bigger, grander. Um, and of course a number of important insights were certainly gained, and of course these all bear relevance to today's session. So the surface collection neatly located the core of the settlement. It's replicated um, in all of the different material types. Um, and the finds numbers um, around about 12,000 items. Um, but of course, I'm not with the illusion that I can identify 25 months of a site's use in 120 years' worth of archaeology. Um, but nevertheless, um, a, a large percentage of the material relates to the post-World War I use of the site when it was given over to ex-servicemen to try and get them back into the community. So it's an interesting story in its own right, but there is enough there that covers that colony period as well for us to, uh, to build narrative and to build stories. And we can identify four primary phases of the site's use, working with the knowledge that that first infrastructural phase belongs to that colony phase, 1838 to 1841. Now, as a local businessman, William Hodson, who bought the land in August 1838 and posted an advertisement um, across the relevant periodicals of the time, proclaiming that work had begun on the construction of this new cooperative society, in which, and I quote, no member would spoil their hat in bowing to superiors, all will be equal. Of course, the 1830s is an era of social contrasts. You've got the pomp and ceremony of Queen Victoria's accession and coronation, um, and of course the hardships of, Oliver Dick, uh, Oliver's, uh, of Dickens' Oliver Twist, um, both of which occur between 1837 and 1838. And over a period of 60 years, Britain had experienced cycles of crop failures, military conflict, all of which saw prices of goods repeatedly rise and then rapidly fall. The Corn Laws of 1815 had maintained a basic high cost um, of cereals, which added to the expense of bread, um, even in the downturn times. And although the basic cost of living fell over all, household incomes of the labouring classes were swallowed by increased rents um, for both land and uh, property. Now, adding to this, in 1830, all exports were reduced 
wages fell by 6% and unemployment doubled to 10%. So it's a you know, really tough time for people in those uh, lower classes. An amendment to the system of poor relief in 1834 further reduced the availability for opportunistic labour on local soils. Um, instead, this was centralised through the workhouse, effectively ring-fencing aspiration and swelling the number of dependent poor. Now, all of this was against a backdrop of a growing population and an increasingly young workforce. Uh, but the irony in this is that the agricultural workforce itself was shrinking, however, their working <coughs> hours were increasing. It went up by almost 25% in this 60-year period to 3,000 hours a year. It's about 8.2 hours a day, seven days a week. Now, time itself had undergone a significant transformation in these 60 years prior to the 1830s. Annual watch production, for example, had doubled to more than half a million timepieces. And time itself had begun to both accelerate and shrink with steam locomotion and telegraph communications, whilst also slowing and expanding in the discipline of geology, for example. So really the rhythm of time is increasing in terms of its contextualization. But in the workplace, time was becoming disciplined and standardized. And I can assume that this wasn't really popular. So the duration of the working day and time taken for breaks were objects of debate that led to the first Regulatory Act um, for the Factory Act of 1833. <coughs> so natural rhythms of activity and rest had become commodified, but rarely valued as potential assets in the, pr in the production process. Now, even in the home, time was now a raw material to be factored into the household budget as a measure of wealth. Across much of society, um, a consumer revolution with unprecedented spending on luxury fashions had emerged with a boom of available leisure time entertainments. But of course, much of this was well beyond the means of labouring families with limited non-time work, sorry, non-work time and available surplus capital. So rising from these circumstances was a movement which referred to itself for the first time as socialist, broadly aiming to return dignity to the labouring classes by balancing the distribution of wealth as well as redefining the notion of wealth itself. And William Hodson drew inspiration in particular for this, uh, of, within this movement for the Maine colony, and particularly from a, bus a businessman uh, who's... Uh, Robert Owen, um, who had foregrounded reason as being unique to humanity, but impoverished under the present conditions of industrial society. According to Owen, the human character is moulded by a combination of its physical and its cultural environment. So finding the right combination of these would, in essence, deliver a pathway to uh, the improvement and effectively the perfectibility of human character. And central to this was community cooperation, reliant upon educational reform and the equality of rights for both men and women. So the physical environment through which communal living would be possible was outlined in a series of designs such as this for a model village by which society could be structured and it effectively works on this quadrangular system, it's symmetrical, um, through which different people can be classified, ordered, and at the centre of this is always a, a, a communal um, building or structure of some form. Now the only depiction that we've got of the Maine colony um, is from the 1840 edition of the Working Bee. Um, of course we can't verify as to how true to reality this was, and of course this is one of the aims of our project. Um, and the bee itself notes that two sides of a quadrangle were constructed uh, with brick and tiled buildings, including 12 to 24 private cottages, a dormitory that would separate married and unmarried tenants and their children as well as the hired labourers. And the aim was that within two years some 100 additional houses would be erected. In addition to this, there were two large communal rooms, 
Um, and these would be for dining, for a theatre, um, there'd be a library, the printing press. Um, there was a large kitchen, um, and then numerous workhouses, um, including a smithy, carpentry, um, and various other buildings. The pit itself from which the clay was extracted would be drained with an Archimedes screw. Um, this would be sort of reformulated to allow all sorts of other uh, things such as shoe polishing and knife um, sharpening and various other things. Um, but according to the working bee, individual plots for gardens uh, were also laid out, um, including an orchard um, and an area for cricket and archery and goodness knows what else. So really quite a substantial infrastructural layout. One of the most extravagant things would have been a 60-foot tower from which everybody could have tea and look upon their own community, look upon the landscape, um, a moated uh, school as well, and the moat being for the kids to play in, effectively. It sounds incredibly dangerous. Um, now, visiting the colony was also encouraged in the belief that once everybody came and saw the successes, <coughs> they would then go off, build their own colonies. This would spread across the nation and across Europe and then the world. Effectively, it was going to be world transforming. Now, we didn't actually find any foundations of the buildings themselves. Now, this suggests that the, the plough soil was just parted, the firm geology underneath was used as a footing, and then the buildings would be erected upon this. Nevertheless, where um, those buildings once would have been established, these deep trencher bucket um, lines um, effectively had removed the, uh, the brick foundation. So we can trace the outline of the buildings themselves. And a number of these sunken floored um, structures were also evident, and they show up on geophysics as these, these lines of blobs effectively forming a terrace um, of the cottages. Now many of the bricks used for these small structures um, were imprinted with the word drain. Now between 1826 and 1850, any brick that was being used in a drainage project had to have this word drain on because it would exempt it from tax. Now of course these are not being used for drainage, these are probably being used for coal storage inside of the buildings. We've been playing with the idea that maybe this is a sort of very early form of tax evasion um, in the 1830s. But the bottom line here is really that these buildings are not going to offer any sense of longevity they're not being built for a thousand years for all this perfectibility in the future, but they're probably being built rapidly to provide a foundation for the younger generation. And much of the emphasis really was on the youngest <coughs> membership of the colony. Children were reportedly housed separately from their families. Um, their welfare would be decided upon by the group rather than by their kin. And the day was highly structured to balance a rhythm of manual and academic learning in class and on the land, punctuated with uh, recreation and artistic classes. So taking hold of the organisation of time supposedly returned power to the community to control their lives, as well as the aspiration for their own future. Now, the equal distribution of wealth in this context was not solely based upon material surplus. Instead, wealth was measured by the availability of non-work time compared with the time needed to attain a high level of material comfort. So no member was supposed to work more than 60 hours a week, and the aim really was that this would be half. You'd work four hours a day and still have enough to live on and have plenty of leisure time thereafter. Now, the early demise of the utopian colony in February 1841 meant that these dreams were not achieved. Indeed, the experience appears to have ended rather sourly. Now, writing to Lord Normandy, who was the Home Secretary, um, Hodgson expresses that he's actually had um, a complete altering of his view of socialism. Um, and actually, then, in 1846, he travels off to America to start a new life, effectively running off from his creditors. Now, his successor, Samuel Howard, at the community, transformed the colony site into a successful brick-making factory in the 1850s housing more people than ever before, and thriving on the construction of the new rail links across the region, as well as the reconstruction of the village of Maney after a devastating fire in 1853. But the material evidence for this period is highly limited. Instead, and possibly rather ironically, it's in the downturn years of the 1860s, 
in which material evidence for abundance actually starts to emerge. Now, this phase of the site's usage corresponded with a diversification of labour categories amongst its inhabitant population. It also saw increased social stratification as the site was gradually divided up into separate property units. Um, and there were at least two tenant families that owned at least 180 or 200 acres of land, um, giving, obviously, uh, labour to other community members. Now, other tenants, by comparison, who were predominantly agricultural labourers, start to hit news reports um, on charges of criminal damage, assault, arrears in payments of rent, and in one case, indecent exposure. So the last surviving buildings at Mainy Colony were pulled down in the 1960s. But the colony buildings themselves, they provided home for multiple generations of at least 100 families. But it's primarily through the traces of their destruction rather than construction that we're able to piece together the site's original layout. By providing a new space for altering the rhythms of industrial time, the unique infrastructure of the original Mainly colony was supposed to provide a pathway to the future perfection of the human character. It's safe to say that it didn't succeed, or at least it hasn't succeeded yet. But you never know, there's still time. Oh, sorry, that's the last surviving remnants of the colony in the 1950s and the last family that lived there who we've uh, done an oral history with. Anyhow, if you want to know any more about this particular project, there's two websites, a Facebook page, and then there's a, a film and the report itself on uh, our own university website. So thank you very much for listening.